Wherever you are in the world, Optica means business. Next Tuesday, September 26, Optica is organizing another global online technology meeting. And this time, we want to discuss transformative impact of biosensing. Using optics-based gene sequencing and cutting-edge biosensors, optical engineers swiftly decoded COVID-19, paving the way for groundbreaking vaccines and treatments. But this is just the beginning. Today, biosensing is key to real-time glucose monitoring for diabetics, swift pathogen detection in food, and more precise cancer marking. At Optica, we want to help corporate members leverage the maximum business opportunities in biosensing. So we have put together a world-class group of people who will share what they need and who can help them. Look who's coming. Benjamin Berstig, Executive Vice President of Rockley Photonics. Luke Schiers, Co-Founder of Surfix Diagnostics. Petteri Ushima, CTO of Modulite. Thanosis Manolis, Principal Engineer at Biosensor Manufacturer Bialum. We welcome back Werner Meintele from Diamond Tech, based in Frankfurt and Ain in Germany. Anton Vasiliev from Ligentech. Jeffrey Owen Katz, co-founder of Sangis Corporation. Sebastian Hulk, the CEO of Tech5, also coming from New York State. And the fascinating Nadine Walter, co-founder of a specialist imaging technology company, Expex AI, based near Cologne. And Brain Martz, CTO of Atomica joining us from Santa Barbara, California. We also invite BioStars to share one slide. Our technology scouting team just came across a new Swiss startup that uses near-infrared spectroscopy to measure oxygen levels in brains of premature babies. The company is called Oxyprem, and don't miss this one. We've also asked critical academics like Laura Lechuga from the Spanish National Research Council to join us right now at the Optica Online Industry Meeting. Let's see who else is here. Let's see who is here in the room. Let me see. I have Bram Bingerling, I have Katrin Boske, I have John Clark, I have all of you. Thank you very much for joining this very important meeting. All of us, all of us are tired of hearing that photonics has key applications in industrial monitoring, in, photo, in photonic intercities for data com. Today, today, my friends, today we are saving and improving lives. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining an online industry meeting on biosensing. When I said who is in the room, who else is in the room, I want you to know that we are overwhelmed overwhelmed by the interest that this meeting has had in the photonic industry. These are the companies that registered today for the meeting. We have from optics manufacturers all the way to companies manufacturing MEMS, all the way to microfluidics, fiber optic companies like OFS, like Senco, like Subcom, infrared detectors like Vigo, market intelligence companies like PwC. We had the thin fin giants like Diavi or Auxora. We are extremely excited to have the photonic integrated circuit community companies like Fix, like VLC. All these companies have registered for this meeting. And if you want to get in touch with any of the participants today, all you have to do is send me an email and I will be more than happy to make the introduction. You know how this works. We have two sets of companies. We have integrators and early adopters. We're going to show six minute presentations about the kind of things that they can do for you and what you can do for them. And then we have one slide from enablers and solution providers who are going to show one slide, only one slide, about how they can match the interest from integrators and early adopters. But every one of you here in the Zoom room is welcome to unmute the microphone and say at any time what your company does and how you can help each other. We're going to make this meeting as interactive as possible. We started on time. We're going to finish on time. We started at 4 p.m. Central European time. We'll finish at 6 p.m. Central European time, which is the same as noon in the Washington, D.C. Uh, I also would like to say that this is the 
Biosense meeting 26th of September. Next meeting we have on the 31st of October. Yeah. Remember the last Tuesday of every month, the next meeting is on augmented reality. Augmented yeah, reality. Yeah. All those companies manufacturing micro optics, meta optics, all the companies manufacturing light engines. You have to be there on the 31st of October. But today, today is all about sensing. And I have a fantastic group of people in front of me. I must say, I must say, Laura, I'm a bit nervous because you're doing the role, Laura Lechuga. I don't know what I'm doing talking about biosensing. Thank you so much for joining all the way from Barcelona. And thank you, all of you. Are you all ready? Let's get started. All of you have told us the challenges. They said, if you organize a meeting on biosensing, you need to bring Rockley Photonics to the room. And that was a big challenge. Uh, we, we contacted them and one minute after they said, of course, we are there. Benjamin Van Steeg, thank you very much for opening the Biosensing Optica Industry Meeting today. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to the company everyone wants to hear about. Yeah. Rocky Photonics, the floor and the attention of everyone is yours. Nice to meet everyone. Uh, and I appreciate that. I'm going to have to ask uh, my colleague to go ahead and share the slides as my laptop's having issues this morning. <clears throat> So this is my first opportunity to uh, present uh, to Optica. I plan to talk uh, really about what we're doing in non-invasive optical wearable sensors. And so I'm gonna try to do a brief background and then happy to answer questions. So on the next slide, a little bit about uh, Rockley. Everyone is very familiar with uh, Rockley's foundation in silicon photonics. What you may not be aware of is over the past several years, we've acquired and developed expertise sort of across the technology stack. So we have a, a talented ASIC design team. We also have full integrated product development groups, as well as uh, uh, expertise in the measurement science, including clinical tests and development. On this slide, you can see our bioptic line of non-invasive wearable sensors. So starting with Bioptics Band, we are using novel Rockley designed sensors to add new capability alongside more mm -hmm. traditional LED based sensing. So obviously we also have pulse oximetry, heart rate, but in addition, uh, using our integrated sensors, we're adding hydration and body temperature to our Bioptics Band. With cardio, we're actually bringing non-invasive blood pressure, uh, really with an emphasis on being able to provide accurate intra-subject tracking and changes within a user over time. And then with our pro line, and we'll talk about the extended spectral region, we're expanding the full spectrum <clears throat> there, and that will allow us to uh, bring to the market things like glucose, ethanol, and lactate. And so on the next slide, you can see an example of our bioptics band where we've integrated our silicon photonics uh, pick chip alongside more traditional LED sensing. So the PCB inset on the upper right, you can see that includes our proprietary photonic integrated circuit that allows us to do uh, spectral sensing and measure uh, both hydration uh, in the dermis of the skin, as well as the temperature of the water in the dermis. So on the next slide, you can see the heart of and foundation of our technology. And that really is the silicon photonics platform that Rockley has developed over many years. This platform uh, allows us to cover a, a very broad spectral region. So we have with the ability on a single chip to integrate over a hundred lasers, all the way down from 1200 nanometers up to 2400 nanometer region. This allows us to make the types of uh, spectral measurements we're gonna talk about in a moment. But what's also important is that it's a wafer uh, level technology. So we have uh, the ability to bond and integrate our 3.5 technology at wafer level. We also do electrical and optical out testing so we can yield known good dye into the downstream processes and maintain high yield. So next slide. So why are we working in that spectral region? Well, when you're looking at measuring compounds in the dermis of a human, this is a unique region that allows you to balance being able to get good chemical information, as well as being able to penetrate light down into the dermis of the skin, several millimeters where you're wanting to measure these compounds. And you can see here the spectral signatures of several different biomarkers of interest. And then on the right, you can see sort of a cartoon version of a spectrophotometer sensor that you just saw in the wearable. 
where we're able to illuminate lasers in different digital patterns and then demodulate the signal on the photodiode and extract the spectral information from the skin. So next slide. So the reason why it's important to have this kind of integrated platform is in order to get the signal to noise requirement, the optical resolution, the number of wavelengths and the broad region, you need to be able to put several milliwatts of power at every wavelength of interest into and out of the dermis. And you also need to be able to do that in a compact platform. So the fact that we can multiplex the light out of a single uh, single mode waveguide then enables us to have very compact uh, coupling optics into the rest of the system. And you can see here, the spectrum on the right, this is a, oh, back one slide, please. This is a human spectrum uh, from the dermis. Uh, it's got some, some little bumps and wiggles because this is the right. I think we lost connection with the audio signal of Benjamin. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Loud and clear. Continue. Very good. So as I was saying, uh, the plot on the left is a spectrum from one of our sensors. You can see the broad region. The gaps where you don't see information is intentional. And that's because you see on the plot on the right, those bands are really directly under the water absorbance features. And so if I were to uh, put lasers in that region, I would simply be gently warming your skin, <clears throat> excuse me, as opposed to getting uh, information back. So just have a couple more slides left. <clears throat> on the next slide, I just wanted to sort of highlight for the, for the group We've recently published a white paper. You, you can follow the link online to get the details of the study. But in addition to the unique spectral-based sensors that we've been talking about, we also have are bringing to uh, <clears throat> commercializing a novel blood pressure sensor. And this uses pulse wave analysis. The inset on the left, you can see the comparison between signals from an indwelling arterial line pressure sensor in a clinical study. The blue trace shows our Rockley uh, laser-based sensor measuring non-invasively. And then the green is a concurrent, more standard PPG signal. And as you can see, we're getting uh, a lot of uh, much better signal fidelity as well as a lot more information content. And that allowed us to generate the results you see here. I'll just touch on a couple highlights. Um, the, the scatter plot in the middle is showing across population and within subjects, the ability for us to not only measure uh, systolic blood pressure, we also measure diastolic, this happens to show the systolic results, to the accuracy required by uh, the ISO spec, but we're also showing intra-subject tracking and that's important. And on the plot on the right, is showing uh, our results against the newly adopted standard, uh, the IEEE standard, which requires that you show good tracking across different uh, blood pressure regions as you move away from a, a person's sort of calibration point. And so the goal is to get all the blue bars down in the green uh, band. And you can see that we are doing so today in our recent study, with the exception of a couple uh, of the extreme regions where we just don't have enough data in our current study. So we're very excited about these results and uh, I'm looking forward to getting to present to you again as we bring these to market. So I believe that's my last slide. So happy to take questions. Thank you very much for being with us today. It is great to have you here, but the only, at the end of the day, what you're doing is offering your silicon photonics expertise to make a spectroscopy based solutions for biosensing. The question here is the entire industry from potential customers and suppliers are in the room. So what can you do for them and what can they do for you? So uh, we obviously do have unique silicon photonic design capabilities and implementation, and as well as with our fab partners, the ability to manufacture at scale. So one of the things Rockley can offer, of course, is the ability to offer custom uh, silicon photonic solutions all the way up to folks who are interested in integrated sensors and modules. So we are sort of across the vertical stack. In terms of what we're looking for, we're looking for from the industry, 
you can imagine that these integrated products require not only the silicon photonics technology, but also expertise and continued innovations in test and development equipment, continued innovations in detector technology. So today we're, uh, we have a, an excellent set of partners and supply chain uh, supporters for these technologies, but we're very interested in continuing to see new innovations, particularly in things like micro optics that will scale at the wafer level, uh, thin profile, high SNR detectors in this wavelength region, you know, there's. Uh... We lost again the audio connection, I believe. But I, I would like to say, first of all, before I give the floor to a couple of questions for you, Benjamin, it means the world to us to have the support of Rockley Photonics in Optica. I know that times have not been easy for, for Rockley Photonics, but I would like to hear from here, say hello to Aaron, the CTO, and to say hello to Ind uh, Andrew, the CEO. You guys, for many years, have illuminated the silicon photonics landscape, opening the new applications in the biosensing market. And we are more than happy to have you here with us. And um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Benjamin. There, there is a company that I want you to meet, which is Sanguis, Jeffrey. But before I go to him, uh, there are three questions that I want to address in the room. The first one is coming all the way from the beautiful city of Lausanne, Ligentech, although I know Anton Vasiliev is actually based in Ghent. Anton, what's on your mind? Well, uh, thank you, Jose. I'm actually also based in Lausanne right now, so uh, I'm uh, moved moved to this beautiful city. Uh, thank you, Benjamin, for a nice presentation. Very awesome to see how this device is really being valued to the complex market as well. Um, I'm very curious to know. So your laser, so your device um, laser output uh, will will heavily depends also on the temperature. I mm -hmm. guess of the actual dye in the chip. Do you use active stabilization of the temperature on, on the wristband or, and how precise does it need to be? Good question. So the precision depends on the application uh, in terms of, of what level of fidelity that you need. Uh, today, our, our pick includes the ability to monitor. Uh, so we, we do at wafer level, we do testing characterization, the wavelengths, so those are known. And then on the pick, we have the ability to monitor wavelength shifts uh, as well, of course, the, the temperature of the, of the silicon itself. So we have good knowledge of the wavelength at the time of measurement. And because the system is quite stable, it's a DBR-based laser, the drift with temperature is relatively small, and we can compensate for it uh, analytically. As as we know what it is. Uh, we also take advantage of the fact that unlike telecom, you know, I am strapping the sensor to a nice warm mammal. So the, uh, the temperature range you have to span while it's there is a bit limited. Thank you okay. very much from, from the beautiful city of Lausanne. Sorry, Anton, I thought you were still in Ghent. From the beautiful city of Lausanne, we go to an even, even more beautiful, sorry, Lausanne, Quebec in Canada to meet Castor Optics, Optica Corporate member. Thank you very much for being with us. Tell us, please, Kathy, what's on your mind? Hi, good morning or good evening or afternoon. The um, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Yes. Perfect. Uh, so my question was, it seemed from your first slide, you're focusing on wristbands for your wearable. Are you considering any other form factor or other types of wearable for your technology? Yeah, so I covered the bioptics bands specifically because those are those are public facing products that we're developing. Uh, we do have other form factors uh, in process depending on the needs of the partner. Um, and then we also, you know, in addition to wearables, there are other biosensing applications off the human body that are also of interest uh, using our chips. Did you have a specific one in mind that you wanted that you wanted to perhaps talk about? No, I'm just educating myself. Thank you. It's great to see the progress that uh, the technology has come so far in detecting uh, analytes in vivo and non-invasively. So it's great to see the science progress so far. Thank you. There is a Benjamin two companies which we thought the technology scouting team of Optica thought that they could do very well business for you. Those are Sanguis Corporation and Atomica. Let's go first to Sanguis Corporation. Jeffrey, thank you very much for the first time of the Optica Online Industry Meetings, Sanguis Corporation. Jeff, please introduce yourself. You have a couple of questions for Benjamin and you also brought one slide to the meeting. Okay, I'm going to share the slide. And uh, can everyone see the slide now? Gorilla Glass Clear. 
Okay, great. Okay. Uh, basically, yeah, thank you, uh, Helena, Olga, and Elise for the opportunity. Zengwitz Corporation is a New York startup that I co-founded several years ago. I'm the chief scientific officer and inventor. We're developing basically advanced Ramon technology, Ramon spectroscopy, that's perfect for biosensing both in vitro and in vivo, including transdermally. Uh, focus is on sensitive low noise spectrometers and probes that make biosensing and the detection of weakly scattering analytes and turbid media practical. Uh, currently, we're developing a new spectrometer that will have much greater sensitivity on par with like SIRS substrates, but without substrates, and will make Ramon pulse plethysmography possible uh, due to its speed. It also lends itself to miniaturization. I was interested in what uh, Rockley was saying because we might need chips made. Uh, and for the assessment of blood analytes, such as glucose, carotenoids, CRPA1C, and all the rest. Uh, it may even be able to detect blood markers for long uh, COVID, uh, all non-invasively, uh, transdermally. Uh, we've already tested several dozen patients with our earlier spectrometer and obtained a strong correlation between the spectrometric results and a glucose meter. We also tested glucose solutions down to the hypoglycemic range, and that's what you can see down here, uh, based on a single simple sum, no curve fitting, of the three most significant peaks in the glucose Ramon spectrum versus known glucose concentrations. That's what this uh, chart is that you can see. Uh, to uh, the same novel spectrometer, uh, has been tested, by the way, with foods and with samples uh, of hard to detect trace analytes from our Antarctic ice, for example, uh, where, where there are trace quantities of PFOS, PFAS, DO, DOC, uh, and we could quantify them with a greater than 0.97 correlation with uh, the devices and, and chemistry that they were using to detect these things. All of our technology has been patented in the US and foreign, and we're confident that our innovations can significantly impact multiple industries. Same goes for the biomedical device based on the technology, uh, that it would enhance the lives of millions, be environmentally sustainable, no medical waste. And right now we're basically looking to try to commercialize our spectrometers and probes uh, and want to further develop our biomedical device and get that to market. Uh, hence, uh, we're seeking uh, partners, industry partners with an established presence in the marketplace uh, with whom uh, we can work on develop further development and application as well as license this technology too. Uh, currently, all the uh, devices and everything are large optical benchtop devices that I could build in the lab here. <laughs> so we haven't tried to miniaturize anything. Uh, but we have got excellent results, as you can see, in the very low hypoglycemic range with glucose, where the measurements are almost spot on. Uh, so I am finished. Jeffrey, thank you so much for, for coming to the meeting. Welcome hey. to Optica. This group of people want to help you do business. Uh, yeah. Helena told me that that uh, you really can do business with, uh, with Rockley Photonics, and I can see that's obvious. I saw that you had two questions for Benjamin. Yes. Uh, basically, we're looking, we're doing Ramon, not infrared, and it is in the region that penetrates the skin, no problem with water, like 600 to 900 nanometers. Yep. Uh, but we need tunable over small ranges, several lasers, like 10 lasers, say, tunable of over maybe five nanometers or less uh, for Ramon spectroscopy, together with sensors, uh, photodiodes that would have to be uh, coated with interference coating for filters. You know, laser block. Or just the laser line. No, yeah. good. Yep. Uh, and the protodia, the uh, lasers would need to be RF modulated at different frequencies, actually low, you know, like one megahertz to five megahertz range. And the photodiodes would need to have tuned or resonant uh, electronics attached to them to filter out unwanted frequencies. Mm -hmm. So we would eventually, down the road, want to make a chip, even if it was a slightly large device that could be a wearable, even a larger wearable, that would basically have maybe 20 lasers of different wavelengths on it, some of them tunable like this, and a bunch of fairly large area photodiodes on the same chip with all the integrated electronics. That could basically emulate what we're doing in a large benchtop system with multiple separate lasers being 
with fiber combiners and all the rest. Benjamin, can you help? <laughs> sure. Uh, if you send me an email, we can talk about uh, opportunities there. The way right. that you're talking about is a different, you know, we, we do have the ability to uh, make photonic integrated circuits in those wavelength regions. It's a different substrate than we're using for our shortwave infrared uh, sensing technology. Right. But yeah, happy to talk with you. I actually have some colleagues on staff who, uh, you know, did their postdocs <clears throat> on non-invasive ramen. So we have, right. we, we, uh, right. we understand what you're working on and some of the challenges. So happy yeah. to talk. Oh, Bernard of... Mantele, all the way from mine. So, so sorry, from from uh, from Frankfurt and Am Ain. Uh, please tell us, <laughs> Werner, what's on your mind? You raise okay, your hand. Um, uh, thanks, Jeff, for this presentation. Can we go back to your slide, please? Yeah, of course. Let me put it back up. I'll okay. Get back to uh, the screen the... And we'll get it on. It should okay. come on the, now. There the it goes. correlation you show here was made on glucose solutions, correct? That was made on glucose Crookes solutions. Using okay. an apparatus looks somewhat like this, but of course the vial would be clear. Okay. This actually is a natto oil from okay. the seeds. So it's measuring okay. carotenoids in the yeah. illustration. Now, now if you if you go for a real skin experiments, what is the scattering? What is the, 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 the correlation then between the real concentration okay. and the measured concentration from Raman spectra. We're getting right now with very crude instrumentation. This is the old spectrometer. There's several spectrometers. The new one is about anywhere from 100 to several thousand times more sensitive using stimulated Raman, among other okay. things. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. interesting variation. Uh, this is with the old spectrometer and the vials in the phys low physiological range, like 50, okay. you know, milligrams per deciliter. Okay. And then uh, the skin, the turbidity of the skin and all of this problem doesn't really affect it, but it adds a lot of unwanted signals. However, yes, I guess so. Pre resonance signals, your question. Pre -resonance right. signals from, from other components of skin. Probably. Right. There's a lot of very strong signals that weaken, that produce more noise Absolutely. on this curve. You can yeah. still get a correlation. It's about point. 8.5 to 0.9, which isn't bad uh, mm -hmm. without having specific calibration. And because, but what the new technology, the new spectrometer I'm building, this one uses a CCD with dispersion, mm -hmm. although the fixed okay. pattern mm -hmm. noise is a hundred fold mm -hmm. lower than commercial products out there right mm -hmm. now. So you don't have the gain variations over wavelength. Mm -hmm. But the no, new thank you very much, Jeffrey. Yeah. And we'll come back to you, but right. there's somebody yeah, that I want Benjamin to meet. The okay. new spectrometer pulse plethysmography avoids the issue of the skin in Raman. I come back to you about that later. I okay. have somebody else who wants to talk to you about that because right. I want Benjamin to meet somebody else. I want to go now. We went from New York and we go all the way to Santa right. Barbara. Funny. Atomica for the first time at an optical line industry meeting. Brian Mar, thank you very much for joining us. The city of Atomica. Tell us what Atomica is and ask your question to Benjamin. Okay, sure. I'll uh, share my slide here. Tomika is a men's manufacturer. Excellent. Okay, can you guys see my slide? Crystal clear. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm Brian Meritz. I'm the CTO of Atomica. And uh, we are the largest uh, MEMS fab in the US. And I just wrote our mission statement out here. Our, our customers are on missions to cure disease and revolutionize sensing and communications. And we are resolved to get them there. Uh, we process on both six and eight inch wafers, primarily silicon. We do a lot of glass wafers as well, as well as some other exotic substrates. Um, and anything you'd expect from a MEMS fab we can do here in Santa Barbara. Um, and I just, uh, yeah, so the question was, how can Atomica members accelerate what we do? Um, well, it's pretty straightforward for a foundry. <laughs> Come to us with your projects. Um, and so I just wanted to go through three kind of examples of things we've done here um, that, that may be relevant to biosensing, as these were all biosensing type um, applications uh, that we were able to adapt. Uh, the first example, uh, let's see, sorry, my screen is, oh, there we go, uh, is a laser micro package, which was used as an optical engine. Um, this, uh, this technology was initially developed for uh, data center communication, telecommunication type applications, um, but we've recently adapted it to be used in a biosensing application. Um, and basically it's, it's just a hermetically sealed package 
uh, where um, you know you can put a, a laser and some other micro optics and use it as a light engine for um, for different applications. Uh, we use a proprietary uh, process to seal uh, the wafer to seal all the lasers in the wafer um, at the same time. So we get thousands of these chips on a wafer, uh, so we can get good economies of scale um, and. Uh, we hermetically package these uh, at the wafer level, which also allows us to do wafer level testing. Um, so we can get, you know, yield uh, out at the wafer level and do that test quickly. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention about this one is, you know, we, we've uh, been working on this technology for a while. We've shipped millions of these parts and uh, recently We've also been improving the process, and recently we've uh, we've we've had a lot of wafers that came out with a hundred percent yield across all wafers. So we're really proud of the improvements we've made there, and uh, and uh, it's a you know technology we've been uh, doing for years, and and it's a pretty mature technology. So if you need a an optical engine that's hermetically sealed, uh, this is a good solution for that. Um, the next one I want to talk about is just. Uh, an example where we have microfluidics, we have MEMS, and we have optics all integrated into one device. Um, this is a, a, a cell sorter with an optically addressable channel. Uh, so we can uh, look at uh, cells as they travel through the channel and decide based on fluorescent markers whether to collect or allow those cells to pass to the, uh, to the uh, waste stream. And this is a, a technology that was developed here, uh, and uh, it, it it's now uh, a product for our customer. So we we manufacture these MEMS chips for them with the with the microfluidic channel with um, with vias through through the wafer to the backside for the waste stream, the collection path, and the input, uh, and with an electromagnetically actuated valve, uh, and. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention on this one is uh, over the last few years, we've really improved the process here. We, we've recently qualified a new process that we worked with the customer to develop that uh, reduced one whole wafer from the from the stack. It used to be a, a it used to use four different wafers, and now we only use three. Um, and we have a glass wafer on top, so there's an optically adjustable channel. And uh, we reduced the process steps by about 40%, so improving cycle time and cost. Um, and we're really proud of that uh, recent uh, qualification. Um, and the last, the last kind of area that I want to talk about where we, we do work with a lot of different companies that are doing different types of biosensing is in C CMOS or silicon photonics post-processing. Uh, mm -hmm. CMOS fabs, I used to work in one, are, are very restrictive in what they can do. Um, and so we'll do a lot of the things that they can't do, um, and things that, you know, as a MEMS fab, we've, we've gained expertise in, um, through the different programs that we've done here. Uh, so obviously we can do precious metals here. We don't, we don't have the same restrictions on precious metals. So adding things like gold, silicon or gold, um, gold tin or, uh, platinum to, uh, either CMOS or silicon photonics wafers, um, Backside wafer processing, deep silicon etching, either on the front side or the back side. You're uh, very impressed. Basically, what you can do is a, is a laser on a package. You can integrate microfluid dimensions and optics, and you can process them. You can manufacture a wafer level and a semiconductor fab. Very impressive, Brian. Uh, right. You have a question for Benjamin. Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, you know, you mentioned the uh, in, in one of your slides. I'll, I'll stop sharing here, but uh, you mentioned in one of your slides that you. Uh, are able to, or in your next generation, you're going to have uh, laser attach, flip chip attach without solder or solderless. And I was just curious uh, how what what that uh, was referring to. Ah, oh, gotcha. So we've, I believe, uh, my colleague uh, Aaron Zilke has published and given some talks on the stamping technology uh, that we use for that, and so. Uh, if you have questions on that, you guys can hit me up and I can put you in contact with the, the right experts in-house to describe. And I know Aaron Silky is watching, so I would like to say hello to my very good friend. Uh, yeah. Brian, welcome to Optica. And Benjamin, you guys are fantastic. And honestly, I have to love every member individually the same, but I love you a little bit more than the average. Rockley Photonics, thank you so much. And hello, Andrew Rickman, you are really fantastic. 
Benjamin, the, thank you so much. And we move ahead. We continue. And you know what? We have been to Santa Barbara. We have been to New York already. We have been to many places so far. We go now to a really amazing place. We go to Cyprus. And why do we go to Cyprus? Because we want to meet for the first time at an Optica Online Industry Meeting, the company Bialum. Bialum is a biosensor manufacturer and is represented today by the principal engineer, Thanasis Manolis. Thanasis, thank you so much for bringing Cyprus to the global Optica network that, that, that industry, that Optica is. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to Bialum. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Yeah, so hello, everyone. Um, sorry. Uh, it's actually an honor to be here today. Uh, in the next few slides, I'll try to briefly describe our technology uh, and activities at Bialum uh, throughout the years. So uh, Bialum is a young deep tech startup located uh, in Nicosia, Cyprus, operating since 2020. Um, I could not uh, think of a better way to start my presentation than a brief introduction to our team. More specifically, Bialum currently consists of five people, as you can see here, our CEO, Dimitris, uh, our, by, our uh, principal scientist, uh, George, Mahmoud, who's uh, our uh, photonics engineer, and Christia, our youngest member, who's our bioengineer. So we're covering almost uh, the full spectrum of uh, our current activities in-house from mask design to surface functionalization to test and measurement. Now, our mission is to develop the necessary diagnostic tools for early diagnosis and treatment of acute infections at the point of need, and more specifically, sepsis. Sepsis is one of the most significant health complications from pathogens from pathogen infections uh, that can lead to tissue damage, organ failure, amputations, and eventually death. Sepsis affects more than 48 uh, million people each year and takes 11 million lives worldwide, costing billions of euros annually. So what we should do, what should the clinicians actually do uh, for sepsis patient survival? The answer is to start appropriate and effective antimicrobial treatment within the first hours of the infection, which classifies sepsis as a highly time-dependent disease. Now, uh, our solution targets to, ad to address exactly that. Here is a co conceptual prototype of how we envision our disposable chip and reader instrument will look like in the future. Our goal is to deliver affordable yet powerful biochips uh, based on proprietary silicon plasma photonic technology embedded in a disposable uh, cartridge uh, in order to scan blood for multiple pathogens and biomarkers within minutes. So we want actually to offer uh, a powerful tool to the clinicians to, to identify uh, blood infections at an early stage in order to start the appropriate treatment to the patient. Now, going deeper to our technology, uh, this is the, our biosensor concept. It's a silicon nitride Maxender uh, interferometer that integrates an aluminum plasmonic transducer in uh, the sensing arm while having some active elements on the reference arm uh, for sensor calibration. Uh, the actual transducer is a 70 mi 7 by 70 micrometer uh, uh, long aluminum plasmonic stripe uh, that enables uh, light propagation on top. Uh, here on the bottom right corner, you can see an SEM image of uh, the actual fabricated device. Um, and uh, I would like to close my presentation with some highlights of our technology so far. So basically we're using uh, CMOS compatible um, materials like aluminum for our plasmonic transducer and uh, silicon nitride for the rest of the circuitry. Um, so we can fabricate our chips with optical lithography in wafers. Uh, its biochip is a 20 by 20, uh, is a 20 by 20 millimeter uh, silicon chip that can host uh, multiple copies of uh, our Maxender uh, biosensor. 
we biofunctionalize uh, our um, aluminum surface using in-house chemistries. So antibodies can be immobilized on top, uh, targeting for pathogen and protein detection on the same chip. Now, some of our recent achievements include E. coli detection down to 10 cells per mil uh, by capturing the whole bacterium and CRP detection in serum samples in the range of one to 40 micrograms. So overall, I would say Biolum technology so far can offer a low cost disposable chip using the CMOS technologies, uh, fast detection, uh, time to result is within minutes, and it's easily scalable, which is, can be attributed to the ultra small footprint of the aluminum plasmoic transducer. Of course, multiplexing is also uh, uh, is, is also a, um, uh, an attribute of, of our chip, so we can uh, so we can actually capture multiple targets like pathogens or proteins on the same chip. So with that, I uh, finish my presentation and I'm open to questions and comments. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. That was a, a, a very good presentation, and this is something that is uh, quite important because effectively, I mean, sepsis is uh, is a is a very big problem, and the amount of that is uh, is unbelievable. And one of the things is in the early diagnostics. So, do we have uh, we have here uh, Legend Tech and Anton? So, can can you say something about uh, how it's going to be these uh, silicon nitrate peaks? Yeah, this is very. This is really amazing that this fits so well with uh, what we do, uh, what we are trying to offer to to customers and startups such as you are. And it's really nice to see that your technology is really pushing it further to, to solve a real world problem. Uh, so maybe I'll just share one slide. Uh, well, I'm a bit. For me, it was a bit difficult to put everything. On the slides, so please, excuse me, I'll share it a few slides. Uh, with the same time, so we are. Uh, there is some background noise. Uh, okay, I think. Okay, um, so here at, we are at Legendtech. We are um, uh, originally a Swiss company. Uh, we are already expanding our presence uh, a little bit so over across Europe. So we have an uh, an office also close to Paris. We're in close proximity to XFAB. And together with our partnership with XFAB, we are actually right now the largest silicon nitride open access foundry in the European Union. So that I think if you want to scale your technology, we are uh, at the right place to enable you to, to produce millions, or well, I hope we'll not have millions of sepsis cases, but we, we want to produce, we can produce a lot of devices for you if you're if you're interested. So we have a um office here in switzerland uh but i'll maybe i'll just show one application that we are uh have people working with um it's, it's similar to what you are doing uh, where we open expose the waveguides of silicon nitrides uh, locally such that we can um, functionalize them so no we do not functionalize them so the other partners of so the application partners such as yourself functionalize those chips with their proprietary technology uh, that allows them to, to use them for, for sensing applications it's for lap on a chip like you, like you, you are doing, not only for bio applications, but also for uh, electronic nose applications. So we have, uh, we are also part of Photonics Fab. So we are the silicon nitride foundry within this consortium, which aims to do, to organize a whole supply chain of devices, next generation devices in, the, in Europe. Uh, so Ari Aribal is one of our partners uh, who's also working on silicon nitride and they're doing a very interesting device. Uh, it uses silicon nitride where they functionalize the, the chip in such a way with different um, sections such that, they, that you can mimic um, an electronic nose. So you, if you have a smell, you can start doing PCA analysis of that uh, data to figure out what, what is exactly now the, the smell that you're smelling without actually smelling it, so which is very, very interesting. Um, so a bit more about ourselves, and here I'll conclude. Uh, so we can support you or others uh, in a seamless journey from idea prototype to high volume. Uh, so we have a uh, low entry, uh, low, low barrier uh, entry model where we can, you can participate in the PW runs, uh, where you run on, uh, on certain stacks that are fixed 
they're reliable, that they can be that are measured, and you have a PDK from it. On top of that, if you want to have something special, like you, you mentioned, you need aluminum nitride, uh, aluminum uh, for your chips, we can develop a custom process with you, together with you, that would allow us to uh, to bring this, this into a 200 millimeter fab that would allow you to produce many, many uh, chips at a very efficient uh, price point. Thank you so much, Anton. This is this is actually very good. I mean, it's, it's like all the integration is key in all the biosensing and all the, the technology that we are discussing today. Uh, we also have in the room, um, uh, we also have Sebastian Hook from Tech5. And uh, I know he's, uh, he's doing also virus detectors uh, like uh, COVID and other kind of virus. Uh, um, Sebastian, are you are you around? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So could you please uh, could you please share your slide and take us a little bit uh, on on this on this diagnosis thing? Thank you. All right. Can you can you see my screen? Now I can see it. Yeah, very clear. Okay, perfect. So yeah. So, so tell my us a little bit question. about you. Yeah. Yeah, so my name is Sebastian Hook. I'm the CEO of a company called Tech5 USA. So I'm usually located on beautiful Long Island, New York, to uh, say in the same way like Jose might uh, introduce it, but I'm currently dialing in from Frankfurt because this is where our headquarters is. So we produce or we design and produce uh, UVIS, NIR, and Raman process spectrometers, but we can also use them in the lab, as you can see here. So in conjunction with UGA, the University of Georgia, uh, we've used or we've developed a SARS sensor to surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy for SARS CoV 2 virus detection. You can also use it for um, different viruses. Uh, so, in this case, it's an indirect version. So, it's an ACE2 capture coupling to the RBD domain of the virus, um, but it also works as RNA and, in the meantime, also as direct viral detection um, system. So, it's, it's very rapid. So, currently, we are at like five minutes. If you fully automate it, which you're intending to do, you can bring it down to probably one minute. It's highly specific. What does it mean? We're currently at 99.8%, but I think we can uh, probably um, make it even better. And what's really unique about it, it's measuring both qualitatively as well as quantitatively. Um, what do we need for it? So um, it's a Raman spectrometer that we've designed, also the optical interface and the SERS substrate. We also have mass production capabilities with OAD, which is oblique angle deposition um, methodologies. And then we've developed the, or actually UGA in this case, the um, machine learning algorithms to interpret the signals. And as I said before, you can fully automate it. So if you wanted to have a high throughput immunoassay, uh, we could do that. And on the right hand side, I'm just showing uh, the different steps. So um, at A, you can see the um, SERS substrate. So these slanted nano rocks made of silver in this case. Uh, we also need to have some um, argon ion um, etching just to remove um, contaminants. And then we apply the um, specific antibody to the nano rocks. So in this case, the ACE2, like you would find in a, in a human cell. Um, and um, then at um, a nasal swab, you can also use sal saliva, whatever you want, um, um, into, like shown here, a PCR tube. And then we incubate the system. So we bring the SERS substrate into this PCR tube. And if the coronavirus or any other virus, uh, we've tested that with influenza um, and also more benign NS63 and various others. And if that virus is present, it would bind to the um, ACE2 cell. And then we wash and dry the substrate, place the whole thing into a Raman spectrometer, use the XYZ table we've developed for that, and also the um, specific optical interface for it so that we can um, position the laser. By the way, we use a 785 nanometer um, um, Raman laser for, in, for this application, and then take the spectra, interpret it, um, and um, can say if it's positive or negative, and in addition, what the virus load is, which is quite important, as you know, when it comes to determining how sick that patient might really get. So um, it's just one slide here. It's obviously way more if you're interested in the technology and how we could fully automate it. I just wanted to limit it uh, to a brief presentation here. 
Yeah, thank, thank you, you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, thank, thank, thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge that Tech5 is a corporate member of Optica, and, I, and the, the way that they are here presenting this Tech5 is an spectroscopy company, and they're looking for partners. They're looking for partners to further develop this and take this to the market. Could you tell us a bit about what kind of partners are you looking for? Who, how we can help you, Sebastian? Yeah, or actually, if you want to produce with us, so we got four business units. We got all the photonics components and building blocks from uh, various benches. Um, I think our core expertise is the electronics that we've developed. So we, we have um, quite some business in the uh, semiconductor business. If you think about multi-layer thin film thickness analysis by means of spectroscopic ellipsometry and, and interferometry, this is where we're really big at. Um, so we've um, developed the electronics to read out the um, analog signals of the imaging sensor in high speeds, digitize it, and then also all the interface um, uh, protocols from Modbus to Profibus to OPC UA, you name it, uh, depending on what they use in the factory. So we're really in uh, semiconductor manufacturing equipment, in um, uh, food, feed, and beverages, in oil and gas, in chemistry, um, and in pharma and biotech um, as the sample or the example here shows today and then business unit number two um we're designing fully fledged turnkey solutions so online analyzers that go into factories to refineries to uh chemical um factories etc and then number three uh, we got some um distribution going on so we belong to the so-called nynomic photonics group mm -hmm. it's a company existing of 11 in total traded at the frankfurt um, stock exchange um, you might know a company called Spectral Engines. They have developed um, also Fabri, Pro, and Ferometers in MEMS technology. We use them for quite a successful products called TactiScan for yes. illicit drug detection. So that's what we're rolling out all the states right now, from heroin to cocaine to fentanyl detection, all the different mixtures, including the cutting agent, so we can we can detect that. Thank, and then thank you very much, Sebastian. If you, if you want to help uh, Tech5, if you can help Tech5, please let us know. They are looking for partners and they are here representing the Nymonic Group. And I also would like to say hello to Ben Oderkirk, former CEO of Avantes, who is the one who introduced me to this fantastic group. Thank you, Sebastian. Let me continue. And um, before we give the floor to Laura Lechuga, I know you all are waiting to hear her. I want to go to Aston University. I want to go to United Kingdom. I want to go to Aston University because now is when we are going to start talking about glucose sensing. And I, I think all of you know Professor Edik Rafailov. If you don't know him, I would like to introduce you to a very dear friend of mine. Edik, thank you for joining us all the way from Aston University. Tell us, how do you measure blood and how do you measure glucose in wearable devices? Edik Rafailov, we cannot hear you. You're, you're on mute. That's the sentence of the pandemic. You are on mute. Do you remember the pandemic? Oh my God, yeah. they're saying COVID is back. Edik, we can hear you now. You can, can you hear me? Crystal clear. No, it's, oh. this, unfortunately, it's not working. I will come back to you after Laura Lechuga. Edic, I'm yes, coming please. back to you after Laura Lechuga. And now, the moment that you've been waiting for, our keynote speaker today, the person that anybody in biosensing has come across and has been inspired by, I would like to give the floor to the head of the nano biosensors and bioanalytical applications of the ICN2, all the way from Spain, my dear country, my dear Laura Lechuga, the floor is yours. Hello uh, to everybody. Can you hear me? Uh, hola, Jose. Very clearly. Hola. Okay, so well, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell um, about our work on nanophotonic biosensors. So I have been working, I think, on nanophotonic biosensors all my life, almost 20 years. Uh, so today I am going to focus how we develop this nanophotonic biosensor, mainly for the diagnostics of bacterial infection. I think already one of my colleagues has already introduced you the problem that we are facing, we call this the, the silence pandemic. And we know that sepsis, not only sepsis, but also the antimicrobial resistant infections due to resistant bacteria is a major concern. We know that in the case of sepsis, for example, in 2017, we have more than 
11 million of deaths and death, more than 40 million of cases, but this mortality is increasing every year. So this is, uh, you can see here how what is my colleagues in the hospital, they are just finding today uh, this one, that uh, someone is coming with an infection to the hospital and they see that most of the, I mean, they so that they know that they have an um, infection by a bacteria, but then the bacteria is completely resistant to any of the antibiotics that we have in the world. So the situation is such a way that uh, we know that by the year 2000, uh, I mean, the predictions say that by the year 2050, probably the number of deaths due to this antimicrobial resistant infection due to sepsis is going to, sep I mean, to, to be even in, uh, more than for cancer. So in 2050, every three seconds, a person will die due to an infection. So as one of my colleagues say before, main problem that we have in our hospital, we have excellent techniques, but you know what happened is this, all these techniques are not um, enough um, rapid. I mean, since a person arrived to the hospital, there is an antibiotic code, and then there is a suspected infection. Uh, once they take the sample, it takes uh, between several days, uh, even a complete one week, to know not only what is the pathogen infecting the person, but also what is the antimicrobial resistant profile. So to know which one is the um, right antibiotic that we have to deliver to the patient. So we want to change this and we want to save time. And then we want to provide a technology where we can move from days to less than one hour in order to, I mean, it's the only way uh, to be able to give uh, the right treatment to the patient. So how we are doing that? So we are doing that in this way. Uh, so we are just um, using our patented, patented uh, silicon photonics technology. Probably if you know my work, uh, we have been working with a new concept that we introduced several years ago, the B-model with that interferometric biosensor. This is a biosensor and interferometric one just fabricating in silicon technology. We have a very high sensitivity. Uh, provided real time, level free, is working in the visible range uh, with a multiplex configuration, and we can afford a limit of detection in the picomolar, femtomolar, in a label free way without any amplification. So, this is what we're working just now. So, we want just to develop on this multiplex biosensor chip, and we want to provide three different biochips. So, the first one is going to detect uh, in a very sensitive way which bacteria is infecting. The, the, the patient, we are going to have a second chip where we can do a very rapid antibiotic susceptibility test. So we, uh, we can know which is the best, and I mean, the suitable uh, antibiotic for the first for this infection. And we are going, to, we are fabricating also a third biosensor where we make a monitoring of the, of the antimicrobial therapy. So what is uh, called the therapeutic drug monitoring. And we account with many previews I and mean, with many results already. So my group has been demonstrated in the several years ago that uh, we are able just to make a very fast bacteria identification and quantification one single step, just directly in the real sample from patients. And we can have, depending on the bacteria and depending on the quality of the antibodies that we're using the selectivity, we can go even for limit of detection below four CCO per milliliter. So mean that our technology has the capability to detect even one single bacteria. Results are always done in a city, for example, this one, a city fluid from patients. You can read also our work, uh, how we detect sepsis and how we develop point of care devices going to the hospital and detecting the sep sepsis in less than 10 minutes, yes, on site in the hospital. But we have already also many results in a, a second biosensor, how we can detect one, we know the bacteria, what is the pathogen infecting. We can detect also what is the profile of the resistant bacteria profile. So we can detect which bacteria, for example, this is a, a result between Staphylococcus aureus, the resistant and the non-resistant one. We can also uh, develop a biosensor where we can detect in a very fast way what is the antimicrobial resistant genes? This is also from E. coli. You can read also in our publication with an astonished limit of detection of atomolar level. And also we have recently also developed another biosensor 
we, where we can um, afford this therapeutic drug monitoring. So we know the pathogen, we know the resistant profile of this pathogen, and then we know which is the, um, the antibiotic that we have to supply to the patient. But what we want to do is also to have a continuous monitoring how is the concentration of this antibiotic in the blood of the patient in order uh, to adjust the dose, the dose that we need for the patient in order to recover as soon as possible. So what our, the time to result to each of these um, uh, um, biosensors is less than 30 minutes each of them. So uh, our next, so we are trying to move, what we like is to moving our biosensor technology real to market. So we have uh, mainly laboratory setups and devices. We are able to fabricate all the sensor chips in even a multiplex configuration, microfluidics. We are an S, we are really, really expert in the surface biofunctionalization. We have a new technique for the biochip packaging. I mean, once we have the sensor and with the bio, uh, all the bioreceptor on top, we have developed all the optical system, electronics, software, and so on. But we need to move this uh, uh, to a commercial product. And we are just starting just now a new company called Heroica Diagnostic. And we'd like to make this um, commercial, I mean, this biosensor a reality. So the idea is that we can provide one device with many different cartridges, with many different application biochips, depending on the, on the pathology. And in any case, we want to contribute to develop this personalized medicine. Um, our promise is that we can go from days to less than one hour, especially in the case of, of the infections. And of course, my group has been working for many years. So we, here is a summary of all the different bio applications that we have been able to develop. Uh, so just in case you are interested in any of them, because we are working not only in health, but also in environmental applications. Uh, so, and this is uh, just uh, a summary of our uh, capabilities, mainly in the application domain, but also uh, we are expert in the fabrication of the photonic biosensor. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. It's really, really impressive because the sensitivity that you are giving in, and the time response that you are giving is quite fast. It's actually very competitive with mass spectrometry, which is usually the, the traditional technique. So this is uh, it's so much, um, I mean, like if you say one bacteria and that's, 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 that's a big deal. It's, it's a big change. I would think it's, it's going to be a big leap in this. So you obviously are looking for, for partnership, but now, uh, so we have here uh, Eric Rafaelov, which trust before. So Eric, are you here? So what do you think about this? Because I mean, you you have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of insights to put in there. Eric, are you there? I think yes. Eric. Hello? Can you okay. hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, but uh, I would like to just because this webinar it's a biosensor, biological sensor development. And I would like to present what we developed and quite possible maybe you will be interested in that because mm -hmm. we have demonstrated useful kind of uh, application of that. And if you give me a flow, I will do that. Because in our case, yeah. we not measure, because what we're trying to do, we're trying to develop a real non-invasive device. In our case, we focus on a laser uh, kind of base devices, not LED because uh, we, one of the effect what we're exploiting it is a laser doppler flowometry which give us information about blood perfusion and at the same time we now start to develop multi-channel system and in our case we introduce autofluorescence technique which give us a metabolic activity and in in this case what we did that we already demonstrated that these devices can be extremely useful for monitoring diseases like uh, diabetes and this one that can be helpful for clinician to monitor medication of the patient uh, because this device it's uh, have a can be transferred remotely sent information to the clean uh, gp or uh, doctors and this one it's uh, why in our case we're just focusing uh, on a non invasive without any blood testing or something like that of course, it's a, this technology, what we're proposing, Jose maybe slightly been a little bit optimistic to say that uh, we can monitor glucose. No, sorry, Jose, we cannot monitor glucose yet. 
but at the same time, technology what we develop is a good background to develop non-invasive uh, blood pressure measurement with high precision. And this one, what we're working on at the moment. And yeah, I have a few slides just to show what how it looks our device. If you give yeah, me yeah, Eric, you have a lot of slides I know, and I have seen your presentations. They are fantastic. Can you show us one slide that summarizes the concept, and then we can go to Laura to see how you can yeah, work to best. Possible. No, I don't want to, to do that. Yes, okay, share. Where, where, where is the share? Just a moment, I will try. By the way, many of you know Eric Rafailov, and you don't, yeah. and you meet him at the conference, have a chat with him. This is one of the most exciting people I know. Eric, tell us. Uh, can, can you see that? I don't know. Yes, yes. Go, to, go to presentation mode, and then we'll see it a bit bigger. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah, this, this one is and a you're sharing the, 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 wrong, the wrong screen. So you go to display settings, then you can revert. OK, let's go again. This is the, the way of doing the meetings live. It's when we all manage to. Yes, I know that. I didn't expect I will perform anything. Can you see now? That we now? Go. Perfectly. Now, this, this one again, it's our main idea. It's a laser light, it just eliminate, and we can pick up its a blood perfusion, how blood is moving. And we know this is a frequency of the old biorhythms that a human body has. And based on that, we can identify intensity of these biorhythms and based on that this one is an example of the stuff and how it looks device this device it looks like that and you can see that to the, compared to the big desktop device it's a it just wearable device which you can wear on a wrist this one it's a main idea of our technology and what i'm trying to say that this what we can we already were developing these devices and our next step, we're just increasing number of channels, but we can increase the uh, functionality of these devices. But at the same time, of course, we would be happy to collaborate with people who are interested in this direction. Yeah, I'm trying uh, to stop because Jose just saying, need to save time. Yeah, thank you very much. No, 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 no. We had to use the time smartly, but never need to save time. We have time. But uh, Eric, thank you very much for being with us. I want to go back to Laura Lechuga. Laura, uh, we know each other for 20 years now. That means that we are really young, you and me. And I would like to ask you, here you have the entire supply chain of photonics and MEMS. How, what can they do for you and what can you do for them? Okay, so well, my, probably my main, um, <clears throat> I have two issues to solve. First is the fabrication, because you know, we are fabricating all our silicon nitride chips with a standard microelectronics fabrication in our clean room in Barcelona. So we have also facilities here, but it's more, um, you know, it's a production clean room, but in any case, it's uh, for commercial purpose, it could be much more difficult. So this is one. And the second is the integration, the full integration in the point of care device, or the full engineering full optical engineering and electronics engineering. So this is probably what we're looking for. Um, or we are more interested in collaborating. Because I mean, we are expert uh, in the bio personalization. We are expert even in fabricating on the cartridge, microfluidics, so it's something that we can do by, by ourselves. Uh, but we are more interested in the full integration in a complete point of care platform. All right. Uh, I want to I want to also come back to you, Laura, because I know you said that you manufacture your own silicon nitrate chips. Could you tell us about the platform that you use at uh, ICN2 and how is the the silicon nitrate platform? Because we also have Stefan Heinemann here from from uh, from Lionix, and we have also Lion Tag as they presented before. Could you tell us about your silicon nitrate platform? Yes. Um, well, the silicon nitrate platform is from ICN2, is from the CNM Microelectronics National Center, and for the Spanish National Research Council, so it's close by to my institute, and it's the big, the biggest, the large facility that we have in Spain for the fabrication of the silicon nitride chips. So this is very nice for us because we are very close by, and also because we are internal users, so the prices are very low. Um, but okay, this is also, I mean, any any of you want to develop these silicon nitride chips, we have also this silicon nitride platform that you can see in the website. Um, link it also to the to uh, to the company uh, BLC in Valencia. So it's the I mean the company who is handling all the silicon nitride platform. 
um, and, but as I say, um, what we're fabricating now, I mean, if we want to go for large scale fabrication, so probably we will need to, to look for another platform outside uh, Spain. Thank you very much for being here. And there is somebody I want you to meet. All of you uh, know that this meeting is very important for us because it is a biosensing meeting. We have uh, our technology scouting team actively looking for uh, new success stories to tell us. And we came up with a company. We found a company called Oxyprem. Alexander Nietzsche, you are here with us. Uh, please unmute your microphone, switch on your camera. Uh, we are really excited to give you the floor right now. This is the equator of the meeting. We still have Surfix, Modulite, and Diamond Tech to tell us how they, are how they are helping the world. But now let's pay attention to this. We have a company developing oxygen saturation sensors for monitoring the brain of babies. We are really excited about this. The floor and the attention of, every of everyone goes to Oxyprim. Of course, we are here, Jose. Thank you for the floor. <laughs> and I mean, I must say, we're all sitting through lots and lots and lots of these conference calls, you know, with lots of people on the line. And I must say, I'm not sure if I've ever been in a meeting in a meeting that was as energetic as this one. So, Jose, I was talking to Stefan before, and we said, if it doesn't work in optics for you, you can be great on uh, TV as a show host. <laughs> <laughs> no, my mother says I have a face for the radio, but that's okay. Alexander, <laughs> please tell us. Okay, great. Let me share the screen. So this one, you should see my slide. Are you? Yes, we do. Yes. Okay, great. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm a CEO of Oxyprem based in Switzerland. And what we do is basically uh, can be summarized under newborn brain protection. So we use a nearest based uh, system to essentially perform tissue oximetry. And our first group of, uh, of patients are prematurely born kids. Um, now, why have we chosen this, this group of patients? Um, fairly simple explanation. Many, many years ago, that was before 2010, um, the Biomedical Optics Research Lab here in Zurich under, under Martin Wolf um, got approached by a large group of neonatal and then pediatric specialists. And they say, hey, we can monitor virtually everything in these kids, but the one thing that we don't see with the precision and the accuracy that we need is the brain oxygen levels. So the Biomedical Optics Lab took, took up the challenge. Uh, many years ago, also our CTO, Stefan Kleiser, is on the call, so he can also answer questions later on. And um, yeah, basically what makes us different and what made our mission so special was that we had to design a reusable sensor. Um, that is uh, special in a way that most uh, sensors that you find otherwise are disposable. Um, disposable sensors are cool solutions, um, but being or having a disposable device always puts restrictions on you in terms of costs, in terms of hardware, how elaborate can it be um, that you're making. So um, for us, it was very clear that we had to go down the reusable road um, if we wanted the precision that we, um, that we were asked for, basically. And the result from that is that our sensor that we are preparing to launch into the market in sometime between one and one and a half years from now um, has 13 wavelengths to interrogate the tissue. So that is uh, versus two to five wavelengths that uh, disposable systems can do. And also on the algorithm side, um, we have come up with an algorithm that is self-calibrating um, that makes all the the readings much more robust um, against things like skin inhomogeneities, hair, and all this kind of stuff. And on the picture that you see on top, um, actually you see a, a, a baby here in the University Hospital in Zurich um, at just uh, 970 grams, and you see our sensor on the head of that child, and you see the hand of the nurse uh, next to that, so the, the size uh, impression is, is quite obvious. So we are packing a lot of technology into a very small space. Um, yeah, well, 
uh, I think for my two minutes, uh, that should be fine. Since we all, I know, we all love working prototypes. So on the bottom left corner, this QR code is our recent prototype. If you scan that, it should actually create an email that you can just fire away. Then we've got your contact details and can provide you with more information on Oxyprem, on our journey, on our technology. And you're all very much invited to do if that. If you miss the QR code, all you have to do is send us an email and we make the introduction for you. Alexander, welcome to Optica. Thank you for joining as a corporate <laughs> member. It is great to have you in the room. Alexander, you. can you remind us which wavelength range do you use? Yes, um, so we are from the mid 500s to 1000 and Stefan, correct me, 1060. Yeah. Me 500 to 1060, just pay attention to this. These guys actually put arrays of LEDs and arrays of detectors and they managed to synchronize them. So this is a really, really amazing, really amazing technology. And they have actually been certified already uh, in the first pilot run. So these guys already have hospitals demanding and actually hospitals using these oxygen sensors. Alexander, how can we help you? You have everyone here, the lasers, the detectors, the LEDs, the packaging, the hospitals. Tell us, how can we help you? <laughs> well, that I will gladly pass over to Stefan because he's the CTO and is he, he there? Uh, has his, of course he is here. I love this. This is how startups work. You know, <laughs> Stefan here and then he unlocks the camera. Right. Stefan, Actually, tell us, he's, he's just you? four meters behind me, so. <laughs> All right. Stefan? Um, yeah, generally, I think, um, yeah, we, we can always reach out to, to, you know, other suppliers, as you can imagine with so many wavelengths, we rely on custom uh, LEDs that have the, the wavelength we need, um, which are not so uh, super standard, of course, uh, regarding detectors, we're, we're also looking at high, highly sensitive ones, uh, still ones uh, that can be fairly easily soldered onto PCBs. And in terms of encasing, we're right now in the domain of uh, casting silicone around uh, yeah, the flexible electronics. So, I mean, uh, generally we're always out looking for uh, additional suppliers and always uh, trying to, to improve on the technology side. Um, so if you supply any of that, uh, we have to have your contacts, yeah. Thank you very much, Stefan. You know Oxyprene joined Optica because there's something that you guys know that we do very well. They are looking for investment and we're helping them also with that part. Thank you very much, Oxyprene. There is a question for you coming all the way from Diamond Tech. Werner, tell us what's on your mind. You are on mute. You are on mute. Okay, yes. um, can you can hear me now? Um, yes. I cannot I cannot supply you with uh, with light sources or detectors, but uh, Alexander, I wanted to ask you: Wouldn't it be a possibility to extend the range of wavelengths uh, by like uh, three to four wavelengths in the blue or near UV to get an access to an important parameter, namely the the Billy pigments uh, to that are, that need to be measured for newborn babies because of the jaundice problem? And that so sounds like you could make a double sensor out of that. It's generally possible to do so. Uh, we wouldn't even have to change much in the device. It's just that, um, uh, well, all the neonatology departments have already devices uh, me measuring bilirubin in the, the babies because it's a common problem, as you say. But um, it's normally but invasively measured. That's true, but they anyway do several um, yeah, they take blood several times a day, mm. typically to, to measure all the other clinical parameters. <clears throat> but I, I believe um, what you suggest could be a valuable addition in, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, once we have established with our device uh, doing near infrared spectroscopy. I mean, we literally only would have to add another LED in the blue. Okay. Thank you very much. And let me continue with the program today. Start is showing you this slide. These are all the companies who registered for this meeting. And then we had the photonic integrity circuit part. If you ask all these people, what is the biggest challenge of making a biosensor with photonic integrity circuits? All of them will tell you, it is not the integrity photonics technology, that's mature. It is the chemistry. It is the surface activation. And to do that, we want to introduce you to the company that has worked really hard over the last decade to solve that particular challenge, surface activation of any semiconductor technology, including integrative photonics. I would like to go to the Netherlands, a beautiful country 
with windmills and with carne milk to introduce Luke Schers, Surfix Diagnostic. The floor and attention of everyone goes to you. So uh, thank you, uh, Jose. Also, thanks for uh, introducing our nice uh, country. Um, yeah, so I'm Luc. Luc uh, Scheres, I started the company in uh, 2011. So the first slide is about uh, the, the company where we are right now. Uh, we are located in Wageningen. Uh, we're a spin-off from Wageningen University, started in 2011. And uh, indeed, as uh, Jose just explained, um, we started as a as a coating chemistry, a coating surface chemistry coating company, uh, and we have been doing this for roughly ten years. Uh, in between, we also got uh, we still once got acquired for this coating technology. Um, but during the pandemic, we made a pivot from coating company into uh, a diagnostic company. Uh, so in twenty twenty one. Uh, we got investment to develop this photonic uh, platform. So we started with a team of surface chemists uh, and we started uh, developing uh, uh, the, the, the photonic diagnostics platform, the, the biosensor technology. Um, and we did some showcase work. So we did, of course, during the pandemic, we did some, some COVID-19 uh, antibody detections. Uh, and we, but then we moved also into the, the sepsis for IL-6 uh, detection as a showcase. Uh, and recently we started a large commercial project on uh, a bladder cancer detection from urine. Um, so we're not a surface chemist company anymore, Jose. I hope you keep this in mind now. So we, we really moved to, to developing the platform. Um, and we are focusing on cancer. So uh, yeah, cancer, why cancer? Because next to uh, sepsis and antimicrobial resistance, uh, diabetes, also cancer is really uh, a world problem, I would say. Uh, but the World Health Organization, if you look at these numbers of new cases, what they predict, and also the the number of deaths, it's yeah, it's really it's huge, it's amazing. Um, but if you start doing uh, better diagnostics, uh, yeah, uh, then definitely you will you you will improve uh, the patient's uh, life um, and also reduce uh, some some healthcare costs uh, significantly. Uh, how we want to do this is uh, with liquid biopsy, biopsy. So I'm not taking uh, biopsy from from a solid tumor, but working from uh, liquid uh, body liquids like like urine or, or blood, for instance. And the nice thing there is that it's quick, it's it's easy, it's it's minimally invasive, invasive uh, and it can be applied uh, during the full uh, patient journey. So going from early cancer screening diagnosis uh, to therapy selection and also uh, treatment monitoring. Uh, so the, the platform we're building, how it looks like, um, you can see on the right images. Um, so what, we, uh, what we're aiming for is an accurate system, so high sensitivity and specificity, uh, multiplexing, so it's a small chip with a lot of sensors on it, uh, so we can detect various biomarkers in one test. It's flexible, so it, it can be done, it can be used for uh, immunoassays, so protein-based uh, testing, uh, but also molecular assays with DNA or RNA. And it can be done on the same instrument. And of course, it should be uh, cheap and simple to use. Um, so on the pictures, you see uh, a five euro coin um, and you see some small chips next to it. So we started with a chip that was five by 10 millimeters and we reduced it, we shrank it uh, to reduce cost as well, uh, but also to increase, yeah, so to the, to the small one, that's a three by three and a half. Uh, and that's, uh, we, that small chip we integrated in the cartridge. And below you see uh, uh, a picture of our, uh, our readout system. It's the first prototype. We are currently, uh, we have three of them now, so we're still validating. Uh, that's where we are right now. Um, how it works, it's a small chip. And if you zoom in, then you can see the, the multiplex design. So you have uh, yeah, all these spiral structures on it um, and two spiral structures together makes one sensor. So it's a self-referencing a system, and then if you even zoom in further, then you can see that the spiral is actually very long, and that means that you have a lot of uh, interaction length with your sample, and that uh, means that we have a very high sensitivity uh, in a multiplex design on a very small footprint chip, um, and how it actually works. So it's, uh, I think it's rather similar than what, what Laura Lechuga and and also Bayalun presented. So we have a we have a surface light is going through the waveguide, 
uh, from left to right. And if you have, for instance, in this case, antibodies on the surface, if you if the specific interaction with an antigen is there, then you get an optical shift, and that optical shift we we detect. Um, we did quite some some proof points already, as I also ex explained in the first uh, slide. So we did quite a lot of of, of COVID work, uh, and then moved to to sepsis with IL six. Uh, and what we show there is that we can be very sensitive, also easily to work with human samples, so serum or plasma. Uh, and we also did a lot of benchmarking with with the Roches and the Abbots and so on uh, to see how they were performing with uh, their uh, systems in the same essays and then we see that we are doing pretty well um yeah what we do we started as a coating company but now we uh, we are definitely a, a bit broader uh, so the photonic chip technology uh, we work together with bionics there so the coating technology we put over it that's our our what we bring in we do a lot of biotechnology so we work a lot with new biotech yeah principles that's so called like that uh, but it's also about maritime technology is also about uh, spotting and printing the right uh, biocapture uh, molecules on the on the sensor so then we convert let's say a, a bare photonic chip into a biochip and that's what we integrate into a cartridge technology also there we have a lot of experience because uh, we did a lot of coating work for my plastic microfluidics so we do there a lot in, in coating the, the the channels not losing your analyte as well uh, and that cartridge then goes into the readout uh, instrument, and then also yeah, a lot of technology comes in. Um, so you, you you need the optical alignment, for instance. Uh, you need data analysis. You need smart uh, algorithms to to extract the data. You want to have noise reduction and so on. And of course, uh, also mentioned already by Laura, it, yeah, manufacturing is definitely a thing. Uh, what we did there already is we uh, we developed a let's say a workflow. Uh, that we can do all the the, the chemistry, so the nano coating, and also the the introduction, this printing of the the biomolecules. Uh, we can do on wafer scale, also the dicing we do on wafer scale, and then we use a pick and place uh, to uh, to to assemble it into a cartridge. Um, and uh, by combining all these technologies, we hope to detect uh, less. So this is what what we're aiming for. This is our development roadmap. Um, so you can see that with the urino assays, I would say that, that looking at the clinically relevant concentrations, we are pretty there already. Uh, but also the last half a year, we're pushing really hard on the molecular diagnostics, and uh, we hope to to reach the, the also the very low concentrations there, so we can uh, can have a market access uh, there as well. Um, and that's my story. Uh, yeah. So the, the, if you want to know questions from my side, Jose, then it's really about... Uh, Thank you so much, scaling, Luke. Scaling, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much, Luke. This is this is really good. So I have a, a very quick, quick, quick question for you. So you are doing this in fluid. So what uh, is it possible to translate this to, to, to um, non-invasive? I mean, you have urine, but uh, non-invasive, like maybe saliva or tears. Sorry, See, I, I know it's very complex. Question? Is it is it possible to translate all this technology other to other fluids like saliva or tears? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we, we did work in milk, but also in, in, in saliva, interstitial fluids could work or sweat. Um, oh, oh then, sweat, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah saliva it's is good. then it's okay for us. But but there was also there are examples like like what the Gentech was showing of Alibal, uh, that's more that's more the, the, the gas phase paper. Paper detection, of course. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 So after this presentation, Laura, tell us what do you think about this now? Well, I mean, we have been, uh, you know, surface and we know each other for a long time. Uh, so just to comment, Elena, that the, I mean, the, the bio, I mean, for a biosensor, you always need a biofluid. I am convinced that the, I mean, this non-optical, I mean, non-invasive uh, technique are very difficult. And you always need uh, a human biofluid in order to make the analysis. This is first. Second, depends on the application. I mean, I mean, you can monitor in uh, saliva, in tear, in sweat, or in blood, or in urine. But depends on your application. I mean, if you're looking for a cancer, probably you need to just to monitor uh, tissue, or you have to monitor blood, 
uh, but it's very, I mean, but you not, cannot find anything in saliva or in sweets. So it depends on the application. You have to think what is the best biofluid that you have, that you need. And the same, I also, I would like to remember also to all of you what a biosensor is. Biosensor means that you have a bio a receptor included in the sensor, mm -hmm. in the sensor. If not, you are making a chemical sensor. So this is something also that I would like to, uh, to address here because when you are speaking about non-invasive detection of glucose, this is a chemical sensor. It's not a, a physical sensor. It's not a biosensor. Remember that biosensor is much more complicated because you have to introduce a biological receptor. And as Luke knows very well, this is the most difficult part. So even if you think our photonic chips are amazing, are complicated, and so on, the most difficult part, remember, is always how to introduce the correct biological receptor that we need to make a very sensitive and a very specific analysis in a drop of a, a human biofluid. Remember that, please. Okay. I, I fully agree. I also heard you saying that we have a very difficult job. Yeah, yeah, it's the most difficult in uh, in, the, in this uh, in this area. All this bio interface is uh, one of the most difficult. So I would like also to offer if any of you want uh, to collaborate and so on. I mean, we are also a surface, we are also experts, so we can collaborate. Uh, what are, what are, what is the biggest challenge? You both are saying, Luke and Laura, this is very difficult. What is the biggest challenge? Well, the biggest challenge that you need to monitor, we want to monitor in a real sample. Imagine that you want to monitor in blood or in urine or in sweat, and you don't want to treat the sample. So you, you just want to use a crude sample. And you have many interference because in blood, in serum, whatever, you have so many interference. And we are detecting at the femtomolar, atomolar level. So you really, really need to produce a very, a, a very sensitive and anti fouling quoting that you are able to detect only the molecule that you want to detect, the analyte, in a very, very complex sample and also with a very, very low level. So you have very few molecules. Imagine that you want to detect very few virus or bacteria or whatever, but you, you have hundreds of interference in the same sample and you need to have to be very selective. So look, this how far are we to have this anti-fouling coating uh, stable and suitable to volume production? Well, the, po the point is that there is not any universal recipe. So this is the bad news <laughs> for everybody is there is not <laughs> universal recipe. Uh, look, it okay. knows quite well as me. Uh, so you have to develop a purpose for each bioreceptor and for each application. It's possible Look. to make a, I mean, a industrial production, but uh, this is an expertise that is kept in each uh, company or in each uh, group. And this is not, I mean, it's not, I mean, there is not a universal recipe. It's not like producing photonic chip that you go to the clean room and then you can fabricate always the same. Look, I, I, I understand because you're nodding along constantly that you fully agree with everything that Laura is saying, but on the, on the, on the manufacturing side as a company, how far are we to have at least for one of the big applications, the stable anti-fouling coating that Laura refers to. Yeah, so so I think that the stable anti-fouling coating is not our biggest challenge. That's really in, in scaling the whole technology. So so the, the coating technology we scaled already to wafer level, the, the printing of the antibodies or the, the DNA, we scaled already to wafer level, but it's more like we, we are still on four, four inch wafers. So we have to increase the size of the wafers. Uh, you want to do QC on wafer scale uh, because we do all the steps with the biology included already on a wafer scale. So how do we can, and we have edge incoupling. So how can we do efficiently uh, QC? Because for the IVDR, yeah, for the regulatory, uh, you have to follow your process and you want to know which chip is working properly because you cannot make a test that is not uh, performing well. Um, so that, I think that that is, yeah, that that is challenging. Um, maybe to comment a bit on the on this specificity and the non-specific absorption and and the coatings. Maybe it's good to explain it to you, uh, Jose, how it works. We we normally we call this romantic surfaces. So imagine you are in the bar, yeah, uh, you and your wife, and there are thirty nine other ladies in the bar, uh, and that means that uh, yeah, if you have a romantic surface then then your wife is only binding to you and the rest of the ladies is repelled so that is that is how it also works in blood or in other 
samples. Uh, I think that's that's always a good example, and then you then you get it. I think I got it. <laughs> that, was, that was a really interesting example. Let me bring to a table because we're having a very nice discussion between two of my dear friends, Laura and Luke. Let me bring a third person to this group. Anton from Ligent Tech. What do you have in mind? Yeah, so I think I think your your biggest challenge is is also what we we are also trying to to address um, close to Paris and at XFab. So there we have our um, 200 millimeter line, which we are installing different modules to. And one of the questions we we also receive from other uh, partners is that can you do certain qualification? Uh, can you ensure that the process that 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 the process are tracked? And so the the fab there is such uh, um, is installed in such a way that that is automatically uh, fulfilled, right? So you have all the processes that are very rigid. So once you install the module, once you install the process, uh, it will become very uh, rigid and and trackable. So you can have a, a whole track from from start to finish of the wafer to your product. Uh, so that's something we should really talk to each other also about how can we how can we help each other. There. But, but that, that sounds like the way for processing of, of making the wafer. But it gets more complex if you it's have also, the chemistry also, and, the biology and, and dicing included as well. Yeah, exactly. So the, that's also not only the processing of the chip itself, but also the, the final steps uh, need to be um, uh, preferably in the same path. Because otherwise, if you start transferring things around, your uh, certifications will probably not, not be able to, you will not be able to get a certification uh, properly certified. So that that's what we're also actively looking into within Photonics Fab is to enable such a value chain, supply chain, together with all different partners uh, across Europe, that you would have a one-stop shop, let's say, where you can go from bare wafer to products, uh, preferably in the same factory, that you can enable uh, your, your high volume devices. Because as I understand, in your case, you're one of the uh, main uh, sensing players uh, or applications areas where you need to, you really need the large volumes, right? You know, uh, Anton and Luke, uh, Laura has been working with me for many years reviewing European projects. Uh, Laura, how close are we to have a peak base certified product in biosensing? In biosensing. Well, I think... Um... Probably now we are much more close after the pandemic, you know, because during the pandemic, everybody just uh, really noticed uh, how useful it was to have uh, this COVID test at home that you can do at home. Uh, so I think this has accelerated a lot, a lot, a lot, um, a lot the transfer of the biosensor, I mean, biosensor devices to the market. So I think now we are in the, in the right moment to try to accelerate and try to go to the market as soon as possible. But remember that the idea is not to have a general technology. The idea is that you have to commercialize applications. What people is looking for are only applications. They don't mind even which is the photonics technology that you have behind. They just want a, a small point of care where you can deploy your drop of sample, um, press the button and in a few minutes to have the answer. Okay, so, uh, so this is, um, what we want to uh, to have in the future. And we can only do that by working together. You want to get in touch with either Anton, Luke, or Laura, or any other of the speakers, or you have to send me an email, jpostoptica.org, and I will make the introduction. You know what, Laura, last Sunday, last Sunday was Cancer Research Day. Okay. Um, because of that, one of our corporate members, all the way in Tampere, Finland, beautiful city, swimming the lake in Yukon, beautiful city, uh, they told us we have made a very big push over the last decade to have technologies for diagnosing and treating cancer. It was very important for us to have at our biosensing meeting the company Modulite. Tommy Hakulinen, thank you very much for being with us today. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to one of the most beautiful cities in this continent, goes to Tampere, Finland. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jose. So I'm covering up for our CDO, Petre Uusima, tonight. Um, pleasure to meet you all and glad to talk to, to you a bit uh, what we do. So I will start sharing my screen. So I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Perfect. 
So, first of all, shortly about uh, moduli. So, uh, we are in the, in the mission of killing the cancer uh, with science and technology. Uh, we are a biomedical company. Um, we are based in Tampere, Finland, indeed, like Jose introduced with sales process also in the United States. Uh, in our um, customer portfolio, we have um, a lot of big pharmas and other Fortune 500 companies and also well-known cancer centers around the globe. Uh, we have been around since year 2000. Uh, and in 2021, we were listed in NASDAQ, first north uh, list in Helsinki Stock Exchange. So we have over 20 years of experience in various laser technologies, and uh, probably them where we are most and best known is our work in life sciences and uh, um, the key strategic areas are oncology, ophthalmology, genetics, and diagnostics. And we are the only vertically integrated medical laser manufacturer in the world. So that makes us special. So we do lasers from semiconductor chip level up to clinical systems. Um, I would like to showcase the uh, light engine um, product of ours. So we call this ML6600. So it's a platform product that can host different laser technologies and it can cover a wide spectrum of wavelengths from UV up to two micron. We focus on understanding the customer's application and then we tailor the product exactly to the customer's specification. What is special on this uh, platform is the cloud connection. And uh, it enables a couple of exciting things like uh, preventive maintenance. So we have a lot of uh, sensor, sensors built in the device so we can monitor the laser parameters as well as uh, also temperature and humidity in the environment and then get um, uh, do some predictive analytics and send the customer a notification that please schedule a service um, call with us should the power, for example, be great. The cloud connection enables also new business models like paper use type of usage. So I think this is also quite unique for our offering. I will show a couple of um, uh, cases um, related to biosensing. So first of all, the uh, fluorescence gustoscopy study that we did. Um, so on this slide and also behind me, you can see our newly built biomedical laboratories. They play a vital role in catalyzing the customer R&D and the laboratories enhance testing of cancer models and light delivery instruments. And this will speed up the customer's journey to the market. Um, in this case, we have tailored the ML7710 clinical laser, laser platform that you can see here on the, on the picture right here. Uh, we tailored it for custoscopy fluorescence imaging, and it was integrated to a photodynamic diagnosis system from Olympus shown here in the picture on the left-hand side. Um, we conducted a series of experiments, optimizing the laser light and the light delivery optics with anatomical bladder model in the biolab. And the laser platform was tailored to include red, green, and blue lasers, which the user can mix to get the perfect illumination. After testing with the anatomical model here, uh, the system was tested with real patients by urologists, shown here on the on the photo and on the right hand side. Same laser can be used also for photodynamic therapy with, um, with any other drugs the customer has and also for localizing the tumor using the fluorescence diagnostics. Other 
showcase that I have is the um, light source, light engine for the uh, flow cytometry application. And um, in this application, many times the challenge is to build a laser that is stable enough to hit the, hit the flow cell uh, repeatedly with the precision of a few microns. And uh, we built a solution where we integrate the laser sources, uh, beam shaping optics, and active beam alignment system to one, one housing. And this can be used as a light source for flow cytometry. The output of this laser is uh, readily configured beam ladder, and this can be automatically adjusted over the cloud to hit the target um, repeatedly and over and over again. So these showcases were the, uh, were the ones that I wanted to introduce you today, and um, thank you for your attention. And, uh, Looking forward to any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you so much. So uh, uh, one of the things that uh, that we have here is like uh, we have presented in this meeting, particularly techniques based in fluorescence and Raman. So what would you say about that? Yeah, I think all, all uh, applications definitely need uh, lasers. Um, so I think they are they are also very interesting for us. So I would be happy to hear what kind of headaches you might have on on the light sources currently. So maybe we would be able to help help you out on that. What the industry can do for you to give me your biggest challenge? Oh, biggest challenge. Um, well, I would be happy to get a really a cool, cool application to uh, to uh, help the industry. Also, um, big volume, difficult to solve, <laughs> and uh, that uh, requires many, many wavelengths and uh, customized optic solutions. So, um... so sorry. Yeah. No, he's looking so, for an application let's... that needs a lot of wavelengths, multi wavelengths, and we yes. already had a few presentations from Biolum. I want to go to Biolum now. Thanasis mm -hmm. Manolis. Thanasis Manolis. I think here we have a company who says vertically integrated, they make laser diodes. Uh, what is, in your opinion, the, 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 the nasty, the difficult wavelengths or the difficult wavelength range that we can actually target or we can challenge in modulite? Well, our technology, we're currently working at Telecom Wavelengths 1550. It's quite mm -hmm. challenging um, also to do this maybe on chip. Uh, however, we uh, we are open to, it's actually an ongoing work currently on Biolum to, to design maybe an optical readout uh, for our uh, sensor. We also have external collaborators, but um, uh, we are also open in this, to discussions specifically maybe for parts like uh, um, high resolution, maybe infrared cameras for our uh, uh, output of the chip. Um, yeah. So Gaetano is here from Hamamatsu and he's gonna give you the cameras that you need, but I want to stay in the light source. You're working on telecom wavelengths. Uh, yeah. I, I understand why, and everybody understands why, but uh, Benjamin, is telecom wavelength the best wavelength for biosensing? It depends on your application. So since we are doing spectroscopy sensing uh, ourselves, telecom's not sufficient for the applications we need. We need the longer wavelength sources. And I, I, everybody knows why I'm asking that. I'm gonna go now to Laura. Laura, is telecom wavelength the best wavelength for biosensing? No, no. Uh, for biosensing, I always recommend to go for the visible and visible yeah. range. And we have been working in visible range uh, during all my all my life, and I'm convinced that it's the best one. That's the reason why 
Most of us are working with silicon nitride technology because then you can chip to visible range. And the main reason is because all the biomolecules, all the bio stuff that we are using are, are transparent in this wetland region. Uh, so um, much you have from then no problem with the water. Remember that we are always using liquid sample. So you have also some problem with the uh, water absorption. So my recommendation is to move the, to the visible range. And also because remember in photonics, one of the most successful biosensor is the sulfas plus non-resonant biosensor working in the in the visible range. So my uh, my advice is also just to make a benchmark and to compare your sensitivity with the sensitivity of the SPR. That's the reason why it's always to work in the visible. So visible range for biosensor. Tommy from biosensor. Modulite, you see that we hear from, from Rockley Photonics and they say we could go to longer wavelengths, uh, then we can go well, to Laura Lechuga, one of my biggest experts, he goes to the visible, there is lots of applications here, there's going to be yes. one more, and no, you're going to no, be very no, amazed what's sensor, coming. For biosensing, I mean, we are working for spectroscopy and so on, it's different, then you can go to longer wavelengths, but for biosensing has to be visible, this is my advice. Laura, what do you think of quantum right. cascade lasers for biosensing? Well, I mean, this is also, remember also that for biosensing, we want to make point of care biosensing. So we have to go for very low cost component. Um, so even if you can't solve, you're working invisible, you can solve just with a standard uh, diet laser. So why to go for a complicated one? And also remember how difficult it is. I mean, if there is any reason to integrate every, all the components on chip, this is another approach. Many people is trying to integrate everything on chip laser, also with cascade laser, photo detector, everything on chip. But then remember in clinical analysis, you have to make one analysis and you have to throw away the complete biochip. So there is no reason why to include all the components on chip. This is also, I think you have to make a standalone device and then just to make a cartridge where you can make a disposable cartridge. Remember the Laura, biosensor can be reused. This is another question. Laura, you, ha you have okay. made the perfect introduction the perfect yeah. introduction to our final speaker today. We okay. go we go to Berlin, we go to Germany, and right now in Germany, I think you guys know that. And we go to Germany and we meet a company that is trying to do the challenge that Laura just said, reducing the cost of the QCL and at the same time producing QCL-based glucose monitoring. Werner Mantele, thank you very much for presenting Optical Corporate Member Diamond Tech to the entire community and tell us how we can help you do things even greater than you already are. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to Diamond Tech. Can you see my presentation? Crystal clear. Crystal clear. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction, Jose. Um, Diamond Tech stands for Diabetes Monitoring Technology, and uh, that is the aim of our company uh, that I co-founded and that I am the uh, chief scientific officer, is to find a way to non-invasively measure blood glucose uh, accurately enough to help diabetes patients. Uh, the, the problem is all known to you. Diabetes is a, is a real pandemic. It's increasing right now. We call it, we count about 530 million people living with diabetes, and that is going up uh, quite a bit. Uh, the uh, question is, if you want to work non-invasively, we have to find body fluids that are reasonable proxies for blood. And the proxy that we have found out, not only we, but we, the proxy that's ideal for an optical non-invasive glucose measurement is uh, interstitial fluid in skin, uh, the liquid surrounding cells in skin and muscle. Um, it's a relatively simple matrix, water, ions, albumin, glucose, phosphate, uh, so less complicated than blood. And it find, you find it in layers uh, as deep as like 20 to 100 micrometers. And that is about the depth and mid-infrared laser beam can penetrate because our um, our indicator for glucose is a glucose signature in the mid-infrared. So uh, in contrast to the, the spectra region presented by, by Rockley um, at the beginning, we are now moving deep into the infrared in the range between about um, 8.5 and 11 microns. And glucose has there a real characteristic signature, which is a combination of vibrations of the carbon oxygen um, stretching and the oxygen hydrogen bending modes. This is very characteristic. It's also actually, it's the vibration that our colleague from Raman spectroscopy also uses 
And uh, we uh, use quantum cascade lasers to address these spectral range. Uh, basically, the principle is shown on the right side. We use an internal reflection element. We uh, use a quantum cascade laser, either tunable, uh, broadly tunable, or uh, as, uh, within, as with individual, wave, individual wavelengths uh, as an array. We uh, send the quantum cascade laser beam in a pulsed mode right into skin. In skin, it excites vibrational levels, basically from vibrational level zero to vibrational level one. You have a, a, an, an immediate excitation, takes about 10 to the minus 12 seconds to go down again. And uh, there is a small amount of heat released according to the amount of glucose that has been, uh, has absorbed that radiation. And that, uh, that, um, Small amount of heat migrates to the surface, enters our internal reflection element and forms a, a thermal lens, a temporary thermal lens. And we send a second laser beam in this thermal lens. Uh, it is deflected and the deflection is detected with a um, position sensitive diode here. That principle is called photothermal detection. We um, developed it from the very beginning. It's nicely patented and it is sensitive enough uh, to uh, detect even small amounts of glucose. Now, um, the the uh, principle has been uh, evaluated in, in on optical benches. Uh, we built an instrument on the basis of that about four years ago. It's called DBase. It's a multi-user device. It contains an external cavity tunable quantum cascade laser. It's CE certified, and we have performed the clinical validation with it on the right side. We have about 100 patients with um, diabetes, mostly type 1 and type, uh, not, not so many type 2, more type 1. We had about 60 healthy volunteers. It was approved by Ethics Commission. Age span was up to 70 plus, uh, male, female, approximately balanced. And um, we did complete oral glucose tolerance tests with each of these volunteers, meaning that over two and a half, three hours, we recorded in parallel, invasively, non-invasively, including a glucose dose and uh, got this uh, correlation diagram on the right side, which is uh, consists of about almost 2000 data pairs and 99% and more are in zones A and B. And this is clinically accepted. And it's about the precision that is normally available for minimally invasive instruments. Now, uh, from there, we have moved on. We have uh, developed a miniaturized version of that. It's the same technology as the D-Base. It has discrete mid-infrared wavelengths in the glucose range. Uh, it has a mini glucose, a mini uh, QL array and a micro lens. And um, the measuring time is approximately 10 seconds and the battery should allow about 50 measurements. It works autonomous, but can connect to smartphone and to app developers. I'm proud to show you a prototype uh, from as of end of last year. This is about smartphone size. It has the measuring crystal here and the uh, complete electronics and, and, and software is working already. We are now finalizing it because it needs uh, more wavelengths right now it has a limited number of wavelengths and the precision can be higher we expect that the finalization will be complete at the end of the year and after uh, the usual regulatory procedure and some more clinical tests we expect to go to the market next summer maybe um, we have visions beyond that because uh, the deep pocket, as we call it, is not the end of the story because we think that we can further miniaturize this with the help of partners and uh, go to a wearable device, a wristband, which continuously measures blood glucose with quantum cascade laser arrays and has data logging and all the uh, things that the diabetes patient needs as a real companion of the diabetes patient. Now, uh, let's sum up again. We have high specificity for glucose because we use the mid-infrared. This is the glucose fingerprint. We have high sensitivity because we have a pulse QCL excitation and our um, uh, own photochemical detection. There are no alternative pathways for, it, for the excitation after, after vibrational excitation. It's just heat and it's an easy non-invasive access to glucose in interstitial fluid of skin little spectral overlap with other molecules and low sensitivity for ambient temperature because we record only 
the laser-induced delta T, and we don't have interference with pigments in skin, this may be a big difference to Raman spectroscopy because the pigments are located in deeper layers. So uh, that's about my story. And that's, uh, at the end, this is the team in Berlin and the former team in Frankfurt. Thank you. Thank you very much, Werner. Thank you very much for that beautiful prototype. Show it to the world. And next summer, next <clears throat> summer, that's, that's just crazy. So are there any questions for Werner? Because uh, there's a question everybody has in mind. <laughs> to what extent is the price of the QCL as a limiting factor? The price of the QCL is a factor as long as you produce 10 or 100 pieces. But our laser partner, the one that develops the array with us, who is uh, Nano Plus in this list here, uh, has calculated that once they produce about 10,000 arrays, the array price goes down far below $1,000 per piece, and once they produce 100,000 or more per year, then the price drops to about $100, $150. So the entire cost of goods for the device can be, um, for reasonable numbers, can be below 1,000 euro or dollars. And that's something that the insurances are going to cover for the diabetes patient. I was at the Live Inger Awards last Friday, and we saw that Quantium, also one company in the QCL, also with that pitch, they, they won one recognition. Uh, we all need this. We all need yeah. low-cost QCL. So yeah. this is something that we all need to work together to create the volume production. Werner, once again, congratulations on everything that you are achieving, you. and we are here to help you. I would like to close this meeting with a dear friend of mine giving the final remarks. I would like to go to Richard Crocom. Uh, I think many of you know him. This is one of the biggest consultants in the spectroscopy domain. Richard, two fantastic hours. Send us away the way that we deserve. Okay, um, thank you very much, um, Jose, for, for this brief opportunity. Um, and, and, and this has been a fantastic session. My, my background, as you said, is in miniature portable handheld spectrometers, and I've been watching them getting smaller and smaller, and especially with the promise of photonic integrated circuits. Um, I think I'd have just a couple of messages to the audience that you really need to understand the analytical spectroscopy. Um, people have messed up badly, not understanding, if you like, sample presentation to, to the spectrometer, and then also throwing all the data into a model getting a correlation, and it turns out to be an accidental correlation. So my, my, my message is, you really need an analytical spectroscopist on staff who understand all, all these things, because people have messed up fairly badly in the past, um, not, not, not doing that. But yeah, um, th um, thank you for the opportunity, Jose. Thank you for the opportunity of having you in the room, and thank you everyone, so as you know, Optica is working really hard on connecting the industry. We are growing very fast in our membership. Thank you, our latest members, Ike and Tech from Aken, to join us actually today. We really want to create a global industry platform, and we cannot do this without having your attitude, the attitude of coming to a meeting and do your best to find ways of working together. Today we saw, for example, how Laura and Luke really had the different views, and at the end, the conclusion was we are stronger when we cooperate. And that's what we want to achieve here. I would like to thank all the people who made this meeting possible and thank all our corporate members for making my dream a reality. All right, so we close the meeting. I would like to ask our IT support to right now cut the internet. We don't want to be live streaming.